Hi, everyone. Does it work okay? Hello? Okay. Hi, everyone. Hi. <laughs> um, today, <laughs> well, let's say the past few days is a bunch of firsts for me. I've never been to a conference. I've, that means I've also never talked at a conference. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to be forgiving, and I've never been outside Africa. So, um, <laughs> so um, I'm actually quite grateful to whoever decided that my talk is worth being here because, yeah, it means a lot to me. So, anyways, uh, to the talk, right? Um, this uh, regarding convenience. Uh, <laughs> It's a, it's a constant question that we tend to ask ourselves. What's the right amount of convenience? So the answer, the answer depends on your background in and outside of Rust. So, I mean, people, people can adapt, but it's complicated by the, the trying to say, please, those, all of those, the people with all those backgrounds, like people but people brand new to the language, people have never programmed before. You know this thing that the people who, there's people who try to do Rust as a first. Actually, I'd like to meet people like that, what their experiences are like. I actually, it's quite, it's quite interesting. Somebody who's never programmed before and then they go for Rust, which I find complicated and I've been programming for a while. So it's like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> who, any, anybody who's used Rust, as a first-time programming language in the room. Ah, oh, cool, man. <laughs> we should. <laughs> I'd like to. <laughs> that's, uh, that's cool. That's cool. OK. So that's cool. So yeah, what's the right amount of convenience? Uh, uh, my, my thought, please speak to me after. What do you think about my thought about this, right? So to me, the right amount of convenience is something that makes tedious things less so without hiding things in a way that surprises anyone. So to me, that's the right amount of convenience. I don't know. I'm, I'm sure there's people who've thought a lot more about this problem than me, so it'd be cool, actually. But anyway, yeah, this is not what the talk is about. Um, <laughs> uh, it's more about exploring those conveniences, really, with, with examples. So yeah. Uh, anyways, uh, let's move on. About me. My name is Tapang Lekonkove, as she said. Uh, does it work? Yeah, okay, because <laughs> I have a different view. Okay, anyways, yeah, I studied electronics formally, and, but I changed careers. Actually, one of the happiest days of my life <laughs> is I applied for a software job. I used to be an electronic technician. I used to work for a defense company. And what we used to build is <laughs> surveillance systems, uh, surveillance systems that you mount on aircraft. So I was at the end of the production line where I actually testing it. It's quite a long process because it's milita military grade stuff. So like, hey, okay. But I was not happy. It was not challenging. So I got out of there. That's why it was one of my happiest days when I got appointed. Somebody took a chance on me. Because I was involved in open source, so I guess the passion, maybe the person liked the passion because I was contributing lots of documentation, some C projects and things like that. So I applied and then I got in. So it's like, wow, I'm a software developer. So <laughs> yeah, so one of my happiest days. And then a few hours ago, actually, uh, I thought, wow, actually, one of my other happiest moments is when I was, my talk was accepted. I couldn't believe it. Like, <laughs> what's wrong with everybody else? What's, <laughs> what's good about my talk? I mean, really? OK. Anyways, they took a chance. I'm here. So anyways, um, yeah, I, I was quite a Python fan. I did quite a lot of contributions to the documentation as well. But yeah, for. For some reason, I lost interest. Maybe I lose interest in Rust, who knows, in three to five years. But I'm here now, so. <laughs> but anyways, yeah, I work at a small company, Johannesburg. Mm, 
there's not a lot of rust in Johannesburg. And my boss, my boss looked around. Well, yeah, he lives in Johannesburg. And yeah, because there isn't a lot, he noticed me and then contacted me. And he gave, gave me a project that I did. Well, it's not really running in production for whatever reason. But anyways, yeah, he took a chance on me and then he got me hired. And yeah, anyways. <laughs> Um, yeah, okay, <laughs> let's move on. Sorry, what did I miss anyways? Oh yeah, well, that's my Tita Hendra. Okay, um, back to the talk for real now. Okay, let's talk about looping. Let's say we want something that produces this sophisticated output. <laughs> um, <coughs> there are options. There's many ways to do things in Rust, right? So you can, you can do it this way, right? You got an array, three elements. We get the counter, we we'll see why it index. <coughs> That's pretty similar to how you do it in C, right? Where you actually track, keep track of the index and stuff like that. I mean, there's a problem, right? Because it's error prone. If you get something wrong, you'll get the panic. Well, at least in, in Rust, you get the panic, right? Uh, anyways, yeah, so what do you do? Um, you check the index. Uh, yeah, so basically, yeah, your index, if your index is the same as a count, you break out of the loop, right? And what we do there, we just print. This, this print is what, is what it was, it's what produces uh, this. So your print line three index, index increment. I don't know, I'm, I'm not really explaining this well, but <laughs> anyways. Um, so things, things become a bit better if we make use of uh, the while keyword. Because a loop is simple, right? It doesn't take an argument. I don't know what you, what, what do you call that, that thing that comes, what do you call, for example, index is less than count? I don't know the name. Is it an argument to a keyword, a conditional? Okay. <laughs> yeah, so loop, loop is, is just basic. It's like, Basically, loop forever unless you break, right? And then we got this where we we don't. Yeah, <clears throat> we got this. We got a bit of help, but it's not much of an improvement because you still you still keep in track of the index. So we just basically we just move the break out of the loop decision elsewhere. It's still there. I mean, the it is in those lines. It's still there. So things are becoming much better now. You don't keep track of the index. You got your array there. You got you create an iterator, and then you use the while, the while loop again. But this time, iterating through well, going through an iterator instead of just doing a conditional. So there you go. Well, let's um go next print. So the cool thing about this, it will just stop for you. That's why you don't means yeah, you don't have to keep the in the index. So, and more sugar. We have the four, four keyword that takes care of that stuff for us. So it practically does this for you. <coughs> and the much simpler code, right? <laughs> and then there's another, way, there's another way of doing this. It's, it's not exactly sugar. I just wanted to put it out there. I also like it because it's cool. I can pretend that I'm a functional programmer a little bit. So there you go. And it's also, for each is actually sort of new. I think it only got accepted in Stable Rust some months ago. Maybe two or three releases ago, I'm, I'm, I'm not too sure. Anyways, so we are done there. Let's move on to the next thing, <coughs> talking about range. So, similar to the last time, sophisticated output. Uh, so how can we get this output? It's another way of doing it. There is this type called range, inclusive. It's not so much used there, eh? not like the range one, but I like it because it's, 
I like it because it's more obvious. I think somebody who programs for the first time is going to look at this like, if we are saying one, two, three, why are we not counting three, you know, kind of thing. So that's why, that's why I like it. So you can do that or you can just do this. It's another convenience. It's kind of a weird syntax. I actually prefer the triple dots that people didn't like because they said, no, it doesn't look too different to the two dots. Like, come on, man. But well, I'm not, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not everyone. So, well, there it is. Anyways, that was a small one. Method calls. This is quite interesting because I learned about this recently, actually, while preparing for the talk. Anyways. Mm, so we have sort of a useless, useless type just created to make a point, right? So what's happening there? We have a struct, right? We, and the struct has three methods. One is new in. New means just create it and increase and current. Increase just increment the counter. So max three means uh, we are going to create a counter that can only have a maximum of three. Yeah, it ends at the number three. So this is the desired output. Less sophisticated than the previous examples. So yeah, <coughs> on the left there, you see there's two columns actually. On the left there is the, is the loop counter. So you can see first loop is zero, one, two, three, four. Goes on like that, right? So how do we, how do we implement that? We can do it this way. So remember one of our three methods, new. We create an instance of this type, <laughs> this max3 type, and then we use that weird syntax. We're gonna count to, from zero to four. That means that's five iter yeah, that's five iterations, right? So what you do, you take the type, you increase. <coughs> yeah, for each, for each loop, basically, yeah, you're going to increase this uh, this type of, of hours and yeah there's that's where you do the prints on the loop there and then yeah so basically yeah you have it would actually be nice to have a laser thing right uh, Does so okay cool <laughs> so anyways so yeah you so you see that should I call it a template or whatever? So yeah, you're gonna loop there. So basically, yeah, say you take the first, the first iteration there. <coughs> Press the green button. Imagine that, right? <laughs> <laughs> take reference to that loop zero, counter, counter one. So, <laughs> so what happens there? We increase. And then we print that, so that's gonna go in there, basically. I don't know what the correct term is. Interpolation, string interpolation, I think. And then basically we print the debug form of the output that we get from here. And that's, that's what you get. So, so you get one, two, three. And then when it gets to three, it just stops because, oh, I pressed the wrong thing. It's just up there because it's not allowed to get three. Next three. So that's the example. Um, so it's kind of a, a verbose way of, of doing it. So there is another way. This is, this is also explicit, but it's not, it's, it's, a li it's a little better to type, I would say, than the other one. But I mean, nobody, nobody ever does this because Rust gives you a little bit of, of magic, yeah, but, so this is pretty much, so what this says is that you borrow mutably max3, because increase actually changes it, right? So that's what it means, and then here you borrow immutably because all you are doing is just reading, just reading the content, right? So that's another way, and what everybody uses is this beautiful magic. So you ignore about all, all of those things about mutability and stuff like that. But it would be good to know in the back of your mind what is actually happening, which is 
one of my motivations for the talk because I actually wanted to know. Sometimes I actually wonder what the hell is going on in here. Why all of this magic? And and but specifically this one, I never even I never even thought. You just see syntax, but you don't you don't quite get it. But if you know what's going on underneath, <coughs> I hope I make sense. <laughs> Anyways, we're done there. So let's talk about self. Also has to do with uh, it has to be with it has to do with this methods and things like that, right? <coughs> Here's a contrived type. <laughs> Another one. <coughs> you'll, you'll notice that these things are functionally the same, but they look a little bit different there and there. What you'll normally see in Rust code is, is this, but this is actually what is happening under the hood. <clears throat> because you'll, you'll see that with with every other methods you must actually you must actually have a binding well a variable <coughs> what's the difference between a variable binding and a binding anyways yeah <laughs> you'll have a, you'll have a binding itself and then you'll have a type right but in methods you just ignore that there's actually this those two kind of things so it sort of magically disappears and then you get this that's why I call it like um, exactly the same. I mean, check. <clears throat> yeah, they, this this just to show that they produce exactly the same output. So increment it, you get one. Increment it again, you get two. Doesn't matter. So yeah, that's that's it. And this is this is the whole list of of that, that kind of magic that we see. So what happens is that in, in your method call, you'll just write self, but it's actually translated to this. Uh, borrow self, translated to that meter will borrow self, it gets translated to this. That's it. <coughs> cool. <coughs> so we're done there. So this is a short one, arithmetic shorthands. This is really to help you not type as much as you otherwise would. So there we go. <coughs> foo equals to one. Foo is equals to foo plus one. Don't want to have to repeat the foo. So I actually don't. I don't actually know how to read this. In my head, I just say. If we increment the one, but it doesn't actually make sense. I'm gonna have to find out actually. But anyways, yeah. So the point here, yeah, you're gonna add one to one is two. That's that's basically what's happening. And then similarly, another another one is a multiplication, where you can do similarly similar thing. Instead of repeating yourself, you just say multiply equals for you get a sixteen four times four is sixteen, right? Is it right? What time so it's called C sixteen? <laughs> What's the reaction? <laughs> okay, anyways. Let's move on to the question mark operator. That's one of the big ones. It's, I actually find it fantastic. Anyways, so if you are handling errors, so you can you can either have that syntax or that syntax. I mean which one looks better, really? <laughs> <laughs> so, actually, somebody somebody did mention that he, they wish that Rust had a call a Rails sort of a Rails mode for beginning people, so that you can, whenever you read code like this, you can actually translate it and then it shows you the raw kind of stuff. There is actually an option in when you use Rust C. Uh, I actually forgot all the options, like, but it's it produces H H I R, which is human, what? Or oh, high level intermediate representation. Just find out uh, how to actually do it. But the output is actually quite ugly. But this is, yeah, no, yeah, it's yo actually. Maybe it's not too hard to make it beautiful, right? It's a it's an idea for an improvement to us. Anyways, um. So basically, it's gonna take this, 
and produce this for you. That's, that's what I did. That. So be, because, I mean, a new person is going to look at this like, what the hell is that now? That's a new, that's a new operator. And then you actually want to, it's like at the beginning, you want to see what's happening. Sometimes you want to suffer a little bit so that you can appreciate the conveniences. So suffering means typing all of this because this really gets, gets tedious. Eh? And yeah, so like in this example, I mean, this thing's, it's, it's boilerplate really, right? So what you do here, you read, it's, also, it's, it's really contrived because there's a much better way of doing this, but it's just to illustrate. So this guy takes, takes this text file and then there's, there's errors. I mean, there's a whole bunch of errors that can happen with I.O., right? So it reads the, this guy um, into this variable. And then later on, because what we actually get is actually bytes. You want to convert that into UTF-8. And strings only work with UTF-8. So what, what you have there is a different error from what you get there. This one is an IO error. This one is a UTF-8 error in case your bytes actually do not comply. They're not, yeah, they're not actually Unicode. So by the way, what's happening here, there is something that I must still figure out. I wanted to, to do something that compiles. So basically, when, I, when, I, when I'm doing my testing, I return, I actually return a box. I, re, I return a result with a box error so that any, any error can be handled. So you, just to, to be convenient, so I can do all of this in one function instead of separate functions. But anyways, uh, so, so writing all of this basically equivalent to this. So you read your string and then you convert to UTF-8. So that's your error handling. That's your error handling. That's a convenience. Yeah, anyways, there's something to do with this. It's read to string. It's available in the standard library. So don't do it this way, just for illustration. <laughs> so anyways, moving on. <coughs> Oh, what's going on here? Something's not aligning here. I forgot to press F5, so something was, was realigned. OK, anyways, uh, this is what it's supposed to look like. Sorry, guys. Anyways, yeah, much better, right? Anyways, uh, moving on. We have uh, this concept of lifetime elision. I was, I was watching Rust before 1.0, so it was quite hairy, the lifetimes that you see. It's like, wow, it's so much, it's so much nicer now because things, things, things can be aligned and then it's safe, it's safe to do it. I mean, here, here's a simple example. It could be, you know, I should have found an, a very, very ugly example. But anyways, so what happens here is that you have, you have a borrowed string that you're just printing. This is actually the same as you don't have to have that, uh, what do you call it? That tick, what is this, what is this kind of character? Tick. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the tick character. Look at that, right, I mean, this syntax, who loves, who loves this? <laughs> is there anybody? <laughs> but I guess uh, the designers didn't really have a choice. I mean, what's the alternative? Because I can't think of an alternative. Did people think of better alternatives like this? But anyways, we stuck with it. It's also weird because you have a random A sprinkled what does A mean, you know? <laughs> Maybe I should have said life, lifetime or something, or LT or whatever. Anyways, so anyways, you don't have to have it in, in most of the cases, actually. Even, even when you have a return, when you return a borrowed type, if, it can, if Rust can safely, safely know that you don't need one, then you don't, you don't need one. So anyways, um, there's another example where you can ignore the lifetime annotation. 
which is const. Maybe this was done last year, I can't remember. In Rust, you always needed to type this super long, let me make use of this. Look at that, right? I mean, you don't have to. A const is aesthetic anyway, so why type it out? Similar to, to aesthetic. It's a, it's a static lifetime, meaning that it lives the entire life of your program. <clears throat> and that's the nature of constant statics, so no need to annotate it like that. And then, yeah, that's, and then, yeah, that's type inference and coercion. I put them in one because I cannot, I do not always 100% know when one is happening and another one is happening. I'm not 100% <laughs> on that one. So I just meshed it in one. Anyways, uh, what do we have here? We are creating a vector from a range. So <clears throat> what happens here, it's, uh, it's sort of similar to, to the earlier example. And then what happens here with collect? Collect basically says put, put all of this uh, iteration values into one into one container. So make them, yeah, into one container, which is a container here is a vec. So you can be super explicit and say, this is a vec of U8, which is bytes. Uh, and then say, go from one to three, basically. So this will produce for you, yeah, an array that's, that has contents one, two, three. So, <clears throat> you can reduce, you don't need that. Rust can see, it's like, oh, okay, you're talking about U8s. You don't have to specify it explicitly, which is, which is cool. Most of the time, this works, because it can be inferred what you're talking about. And even less, I mean, if one of the items is of a specific type, then it's going to be inferred that the rest is inferred or coerced, so <laughs> I don't know. Uh, or you can just fall back to in type. Uh, this thing, there was actually some discussion about this where people didn't want integer fallbacks. You have to be explicit about everything and stuff like that. And then some cool people decided, you know what, you can fall back. There's a lot of times where you don't care the exact size, the exact size of your integers. And then I32, it's a safe default. So what that means is that that's, that's I32, and that's I32, that's I32. So time, you're that? Could you spend like 30 seconds wrapping up, please? Oh, already? Thanks. My goodness. Yeah. Ooh. Damn, OK. Ah, my goodness. <laughs> what do I skip? OK. Um, yes, OK, there's some. There's some weirdness happening there. Ah, damn, but I only have 30 seconds or 20 <laughs> seconds. Anyways, um, let me move through quickly. I don't know what to skip, what to talk about. Okay. Um, I'll just, let me just move a little bit fast on this. Um, 30 seconds. <laughs> 30 seconds, oh my goodness, okay. Um, yeah, there's, there was a bunch of examples. There's a derive, there's a derive for example where I talked about, um, <coughs> derive is basically sort of code in sessions like macros where you want to avoid the tedium of, um, of typing everything out. For example, I mean, look at this example. If you want to do a debug print of of something, you, you could do this. I mean, look at all of that. The way you say, I'm going to print point, and then one of the field is y, and one field is y, another one is x, just so that you can get this, this output, or you can just use derived debug back. It's one convenience. So there's another one, derived coercion, which we are skipping, mm -hmm. and then there is, uh, <laughs> If led, oh my goodness, pretty imports. 
I mean, look at this, right? I mean, look at that and then compare it to this. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I mean, anyways, okay. Sorry for being bad with time. Um, <laughs> mm. Okay. <laughs> okay.